Revelation chapter 5, as I, I call them to worship. <coughs> taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. We'll just open in a short word of prayer. Our loving and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for drawing us back to this hour of worship. I thank you, Lord, that whether we be a few or many, we join with an innumerable host in heaven, and that sing, Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb. We thank you, Lord, that you have drawn us out of different tongues and people and nations and brought us together this evening that we might declare his worth upon the earth. Lord, we do pray that you would bring in the lost, that you would have mercy upon those around us in this area, who have no thought for their own souls, who have no thought for the sacrifice and the love of the Saviour, for them. We pray, Lord, that you would draw the lost to yourself. Oh, Lord, we thank you for the great privilege given us that you have drawn us to your Son, that we know him as our Saviour and as our Lord, and that he has made us to one day be kings, and even this day to be a priests, the priesthood of all believers. We give thanks in Jesus' precious name.
precious heavenly Father. We give thanks this day for your many blessings upon us. We thank you, Lord, for every blessing of this life and earth that you have given us, for a roof over our heads, for food to eat, for all that we have need of, Lord, you have provided. And Lord, we thank you above all that our great need you have provided. Lord, that great need that only Christ could satisfy, that only he could meet, the need of the sinner, the need of the one who stands in enmity towards God, who lives day by day under his wrath and judgment because of his, his sin and his defiance. And oh Lord, we thank you for the day that you awoke our hearts to seek out our Lord for redemption. And Lord, we thank you for the revelation that you have given to us that long before we ever came to him, he had set his love upon his people. That from an eternity past, that great covenant of redemption was made, moved by nothing in us, but moved by the great love of God. Oh Lord, we thank you for your great grace that would work out such a mighty plan of redemption, that would bridge that unbridgeable gulf, that massive span between a holy God and sinful creatures of dust. Oh Lord, we come before you with thankful hearts. Lord, it is our earnest desire that others may know and taste of the sweetness of your mercy. Lord, for those who stand afar off, we pray, O oh Lord, that you would have mercy upon them and draw them to yourself. Lord, we pray for those around us in this area. We pray for every outreach effort of this church. We pray for those in Wendana, those who have received a tracts in their letterbox. Oh Lord, we pray that you would have mercy upon them. In this dark age, Lord, give them, we pray, a sight of the Saviour, that their hearts would be drawn out after him. Lord, we let me thank you for the time spent in your house this morning. We thank you for visitors in. We pray, Lord, that if there be any outside of Christ, that, oh Lord, you would draw them to yourself. Lord, we do remember those amongst us and those associated with the congregation who are unwell and struggling in their health. We pray, O oh Lord, that you might uh, touch them, that they might know that healing touch of the Lord upon them, raising them up to good health. We pray especially, Lord, that you would give them grace in their hour of need. Lord, surely it is our testimony, and it will be our testimony in the end, that thy grace was sufficient for me. We pray, Lord, that you might make them to know that sufficiency of grace in their hour of need. Our Father, we do pray for this nation in which you have placed us. Lord, that we know that we ought to seek its peace and its good. Yet as we look around us, we see a nation that has turned its back on God, that has no regard or little regard for his word and for the name of your dear Son. Oh Lord, we pray that you might have mercy upon it. We pray, Lord, that we may see days of reviving again, of the lost coming in and asking, what shall I do that I might be saved? Have mercy, we pray, Lord. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would build up this work, to build your church, Lord, that the gates of hell will not prevail against its advances. Lord, we thank you that you are yet building your church. Even in days when it appears not, yet we know your word is true your church is going on from strength to strength. So Lord, we do commit this hour to you. We pray, O Lord, that you might speak to our hearts. Minister to us, we pray, by thy Holy Spirit. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. We continue our worship, please, by returning to Psalm 51 as we continue our studies in Psalm 51, and we will sing the latter a section of the psalm, beginning from verse 9 to verse 15. We'll stand together as we sing. <laughs>
Psalm 51. And we'll first read a few verses from Psalm 51 and then turn to Psalm 32. Psalm 51, the reading beginning from verse 13, starts with the word then. So we have better go back to read from verse 10, our text from last week. And then we will read on to verse 19. Psalm 51, verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. For then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. Thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. As David says, I will teach transgressors thy ways. Most commentators believe that Psalm 32 follows chronologically from Psalm 51, and that this is indeed a David's teaching to transgressors. He's teaching by which sinners shall be converted. So we will turn to Psalm 32, a psalm of David, a masculine, masculine meaning giving instruction. This is David's teaching then. Psalm 32. A blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. A blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. For when I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. See the poetic writing of David, that whilst he kept silence, while he refused to repent out loud, there was nevertheless this roaring within him all the day long. For day and night my hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer, Sila. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin, Sila. For this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. See them. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held, held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked. But he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass or surround him about. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. Amen. Love the sound of our Lord's voice in his word. Mercy shall compass the righteous about. Therefore, they should be glad in the Lord. Turn to him 205, please, for our offering him as we remain seated. In 205, only a sinner saved.
transfer us to the external <laughs> suit. <laughs> okay. If you'll turn there again, please, to Psalm 51. And last week we looked at verses 10 to 12. And we'll look this, this evening at verses 13 to 15. But as I mentioned last week, an outline, a possible outline for Psalm 51 would be as follows. Verses 1 to 5 are his plea, David's plea for mercy. Verses 6 to 9 convey his hope in that plea, that God has indeed heard and will answer. And we noted how many times the word shall is used in those verses. And then last week we thought of that assurance given to the repentant sinner. That assurance that by God's mercy, he will not take his Holy Spirit from us. He will not leave us or cast us off. There is that assurance of mercy. But the second half of the psalm, from verse 13, really convey uh, something more than David's own personal repentance. It really is his ministry of mercy to others. And even as we have just sang, some of these would be David's words as he would teach transgressors God's way, he would say that he is a sinner saved by grace. Let's read from verse 13. And then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, for thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth for thy praise. Let us just ask for the Lord's help as we come to this word. Our loving and gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for that wonderful way that your Holy Spirit worked in David's heart, even as he spoke with Nathan the prophet that day. Lord, we thank you that the record of his sin and the record of his repentance have been preserved for our benefit. Lord, we thank you for the great reliability of Scripture, <coughs> that we can rest upon it as the very Word of God, inspired by your Holy Spirit, recorded under the, thy Holy Spirit, preserved by thy Holy Spirit, for our good, for our benefit. We pray, O Lord, as we come to consider thy Word this evening, that you would indeed do us good that that same Holy Spirit of God would take that word and write it upon our hearts. O oh Lord, that even as David's heart's desire was to teach others of thy way, that Lord, we might be those who have learned that lesson too. Help us, Lord, to be thy witnesses and to teach others too the, the, the great ways of God's free gift of salvation. Help us now, we pray, Lord. We confess our great need of thy help and the teaching and instruction of thy Holy Spirit. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Other than a pride, one of the most binding and persistent sins which every believer must struggle against is that of our own inherent natural selfishness. No one needs to teach us to be self-centered. Our parents didn't have to tell us, now you, don't worry about anyone else, those toys are just yours, don't let anyone else borrow from you, don't share with anyone, you look after yourself. Our, our parents, nor our teachers, never had to teach us that. It came most naturally. And the world, the flesh and the devil, these great enemies of our souls, work together with that aim of keeping us self-absorbed and self-centered for two great reasons. The one is, it is sure to keep us miserable. There is no misery like someone who is totally self-absorbed. But secondly, it will hold us back from being of any beneficial good or blessing uh, to others around us. In this final uh, section of Psalm 51, which I have titled as David's Ministry of Mercy, uh, David's thoughts now turn from his own personal repentance 
They turn to the greater common good, the need for repentance and revival in his nation amongst his fellow kinsmen of Israel. Out of this deep assurance of God's mercy and grace towards him, notwithstanding the greatness, the depravity of his sin, out of this, David, having tasted the sweetness of God's <coughs> mercy and grace, has this deep desire and to share it with others. As I say, our, our, our childhood and uh, uh, sometimes our adolescence are typically marked by selfishness. Not always, but quite typically, quite naturally. And even so, as children or as babes in the faith, our first concern is entirely for our own salvation. We want to make our own calling and election sure, which is good and right. <coughs> but sometimes it's just for us a deep desire for ourselves to avoid judgment and hell. This is very natural and has its own place in salvation, in that God has put within us a natural self-preservation. It shows the spirit that exists behind the suicide and euthanasia. How unnatural that is. It does not come from the God of grace and mercy who has put within us this natural self-preservation. So it is not wrong in itself as a babe in Christ to have this focus on making sure of our own salvation. But as we mature into adulthood, life and years and trials and sufferings tend to mature us to consider others. At first, particularly in marriage, we have to consider our spouse. Now sometimes we can do that somewhat begrudgingly between a husband <coughs> and a wife. But still, we have to be drawn out from this self-absorption. But then when we have children, well, it is no longer begrudging. It is much more willing that we give of ourselves uh, for our children. And then when we have grandchildren, well, sometimes it becomes excessive. We, we have no thought for ourselves if we can only know that our grandchildren are, are well. And even so, in the same way as the believer matures, as he matures and grows in the Lord and in his relationship with the Lord, he too has a desire for others beyond himself. He has tasted the Lord's goodness. He has seen the beauty of Jesus Christ. And it is his heart's desire for others. And so David, having experienced these glorious fruits of repentance that we thought of last week, those great assurances given to him by the Holy Spirit, and given to every repentant sinner by the Holy Spirit. His thoughts now turn to the needs of others around him, and their need of so great a salvation. How freely he has received, how freely he would give. And so in verse 13, he comes down and he says, Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. I have said it before, and I'll say it again, that we cannot improve on David's spirit-inspired theology. David here shows us in this verse that he recognizes both the responsibility of man and the sovereignty of God in salvation. He says, I will teach transgressors thy ways. He recognizes his responsibility and ours to explain to others God's way of salvation. But he doesn't take the next step and say that he will then convert them. They are two very different things. David and every believer should teach others God's way of salvation. But sinners shall be converted unto God by his Holy Spirit alone. It is the sovereign work of God's Spirit alone to regenerate a dead heart of stone. The Bible teaches us both these truths equally, man's responsibility and uh, God's sovereignty. And so man's responsibility is to obey the gospel call 
to repent and believe. Really, when we think of it, it is a most reasonable call that God makes upon the rebellious sinner. It is most reasonable for God to say that those who have been at enmity with Him, who have refused to submit to His authority, although He has created all that is around them and created them from the dust, that now if they would have peace with Him, these sinful rebels must come to Him, confess their guilt honestly, ask for His forgiveness, and trust in the Saviour that He has provided. As I say, the gospel call is very reasonable. It is very unreasonable for man to continue in his defiance against that call. And indeed, when the sinner does come, and in obedience to the gospel call, he humbles his heart to repent and to believe. He finds that even that was not something of his own doing. But the only reason he is able to repent and believe is because God first loved him before he ever turned to him. The only reason he is able to repent and believe is because God has given him a new heart of flesh and taken out his heart of stone. We see this doctrine more clearly in the New Testament. We see it in Romans chapter 9 and chapter 10. Romans chapter 9 gives us that doctrine of election. Our God loved Jacob, but not Esau, before they had done anything a good or bad. We see there the sovereignty of God's election. But then the very next chapter, Romans chapter 10, tells us that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so here, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, David is here doing and showing us to do exactly what the Lord Jesus commissions all believers to do. Go and teach all nations. He says, I will teach transgressors of thy ways. That is our responsibility, our duty as believers. But that is the limit of it. That we are to bring God's word of truth, his gospel, to the unbeliever. And not to force them, and not to pressurize them, not to intimidate them, but to conversion. Well, some would say, well, that's not true. You say to the sinner that if he doesn't repent, he will go to hell. Well, that is not intimidation. That is not a threat. That is telling them the truth of what God has revealed to us. We are there, therefore called to present that truth without apology, but also without force, without duress, without pressure upon the unbeliever. Because His Spirit, if we are faithful to witness for Him, to teach that gospel truth, then His Spirit will convert and save whosoever that He wills. We remember the rich young ruler in Matthew 19 and also in Mark's account, who comes to the Lord Jesus, and He comes running up to Him so eager and keen as He, and says, What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And when our Lord tells him, to sell all that he has and follow him, it says that the man went away a sad. <coughs> he was told the truth, but he was not forced to convert. There was no further pressure brought, brought upon him. Now having said that, many accuse Calvinists in particular of having such little love for the unbeliever such little concern for their salvation that they see no point in outreach, in evangelism. Well, as we read David's verse 13 here, Psalm 51 verse 13, there is no pessimism in David here. He says, I will teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. David is saying, faith will come by the hearing of God's word. Now, whether we see it from day to day, nevertheless the Holy Spirit is working through the preaching of his word. And we may not, not know how, where, or when a soul will be converted. <coughs> but this we know, 
that God's word will not return to him void, and that the Spirit will indeed convert sinners as we are faithful to teach his word. The question then is how will David uh, teach others uh, God's way of salvation? How will he be this witness for God, having ex tasted and experienced the wonder of his mercy? And in the remaining verses of Psalm 51, we see, firstly, it is by the witness of his personal conversion, and secondly, by the witness of his private testimony, and then thirdly, the Lord willing, next uh, Sunday evening, we will look at the witness of his public worship, and the great emphasis that David places upon that at the conclusion of the psalm. But firstly, uh, by the witness of our personal uh, conversion, Verse 14, deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the dark God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. David is saying, if God has indeed forgiven me of my blood guiltiness, my conspiracy to murder Uriah, Uriah who is listed as one of David's mighty man. But he's listed as the last name in the list, almost as though David was loath to admit it, that he had arranged for the murder of one of his own faithful and mighty men. There is great aggravation, addition to David's guilt in this sin. And so David says, if God would indeed forgive me my blood guiltiness, a man who should face the death penalty for murder and conspiracy to murder. Oh, then he will sing aloud, he says to others, to hear his praise. Because if God is able to forgive a man like David, so grievous a sin, then there is no one who is too far gone for the Lord to redeem him and save him. Sure, we often wonder how it is that we can witness for our Lord, what it is that we can say and do uh, to bring others to some understanding of the gospel. I'm convinced there is no greater witness to God's love and mercy and power in a believer's life than that very change of attitude, that very change of heart that others can't help but see in the life of one who is born again of the Spirit of God. We cannot see here, although we have some limited sight of it, the change in David's life from what he is now as a repentant sinner to what he has been in the year past, or at least nine months past, of one refusing to repent, refusing to come in a restored relationship to the Lord. But what a great change of heart others would have seen in him at this time. And as he thinks upon his blood guiltiness here in verse 14, his first desire is not so much to teach or to preach and to show others how much he has learned so that they could be as good and as holy as him. Not at all. Rather, this is his desire, that his tongue will sing aloud of thy righteousness. The one he will sing out loud, that he will praise the Lord openly, and that in it there will be no mention of any supposed righteousness of his own, but only of God's righteousness. And David, as we have thought before, had tried to conceal the sin for months, and that is why he had arranged uh, for Uriah's uh, death in the battle, uh, seemingly in the battle, but was really conspiracy of murder. But now, <coughs> his common knowledge, what had been rumours for a long time, are now confirmed effects. But David is a humble man. But he's humbled by his sin. But he in himself is even more humbled by the grace and mercy that he did not deserve, but he has received. And so he cannot sing one line of his own righteousness, of his own self-worthiness, but only sing of God's righteousness. I will sing aloud of thy righteousness. 
And that is the same righteousness that we have by faith in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. For he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That is the righteousness that David would sing of. He's not singing here like some holy priest uh, telling others how they can uh, be better like him, how they can prepare themselves to receive God's mercy, not at all. Rather, he sings like one beggar, but telling another beggar where bread that can be found. As we think of David's blood guiltiness in the matter of Uriah, it's very easy to look at David and to say how glad we are that we do not have murderous blood on our hands. How glad we are that out of all the sins we have committed and who can number them? But how grateful we are that we have not committed this one, that we are not responsible for another man's death. We see that attitude in a Pilate at our Lord's trial when he washed his hands and said, I am innocent of this man's blood. And when we come to the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we sang earlier at Calvary, and as we look at our Lord upon the cross and we ask the question then, who is guilty for his murder? Who has caused his suffering and his death? We know towards the end of Luther's life, and quite sadly, his focus on who was guilty for the Lord's death but focused on the Jews. And much of his writing became a quite anti-Semitic. As we look at our Lord's death and ask, who has caused his suffering and death? Who is guilty of that murder? We look and we find that it is ourselves. That we are no less guilty than David, or Pilate, or the Pharisees, or the Jews, or the Romans. For as we read in Isaiah 53, the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. It is our griefs it is our sins that they be born. And so we are no different to David when we come and confess our blood guiltiness. David was guilty of conspiring against the blood of Uriah. We are guilty in that our sin caused the shedding of our Saviour's blood. There is a great change in a man's attitude when he is born again of the Holy Spirit of God. And that is the first witness, the witness of a personal conversion. The second is the witness of our private testimony in verse 15. And David says, O Lord, open thou my lips, my lips and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. We know from our catechism, a man's chief aim is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. It is our chief aim that God should open our lips and that our mouth should show forth His praise. We are to pray the same prayer as David prays here, that whatever our disposition, there's no doubt some of us by nature are more bold in our confession and profession of faith than others. But whatever our personal disposition, that the Lord will indeed open our lips and give us opportunity, and give us boldness, that we would glorify God and enjoy Him forever. How would David uh, teach uh, transgress transgressors in the way of salvation? Well, we read very little of David as a teacher or as a preacher. Um, we know that the name preacher is used of Solomon much more than of David. But David had other giftings. He was a singer and a poet. And David used those giftings to teach transgressors thy ways of salvation. 
And as I say, most commentators agree that Psalm 32 follows on from Psalm 51 as David's teaching in a poetic way. The way he writes the psalm is teaching on repentance and uh, salvation. And you'll see as we read through the Psalm 32, the absolute absence of any reference to any goodness or self-improvement or working towards his salvation. Rather, his testimony is this, that he is a sinner saved by grace, <coughs> that he is the recipient of God's free, unmerited grace. And really, if you could summarize Psalm 32, it would be words like this. This is his teaching. But don't delay like me. And come to him now. Don't improve yourself or try to before you come to him. Come to him now, just as you are. In Matthew 25, our Lord speaks the parable of the talents. How a man went on a far journey and he left talents with his servants. To some he gave one and two and ten talents. And the most sermons you'll have ever heard on that passage speak about the talents or the abilities and giftings that God has placed within each one of us. But if we think of David, and if we think of ourselves, what is the talent that God has invested in us, expecting a return on it? It really is the talent of His mercy. That is what God has invested in every saint, in every born-again believer. This unmerited mercy and favor and kindness, the goodness of God. And it is that which He would have us share as freely as we have received it. And that is what David is doing in Psalm 32. I'd just like us, in the time that remains, to think of uh, David's <coughs> private testimony, although it is not private, it is public in scripture, but it is his testimony of how he would teach and transgresses the way of salvation. Now, firstly, we see that Psalm 32 opens with the word blessed. They were saying there is no blessedness in life like the blessedness of sins being kept covered, of sins of being forgiven. There is nothing to match with it. This world has nothing to offer that can compare with the joy, the peace, the blessedness of our sins being taken away from us. And so he says how how do we reach that blessed state? How do we know and come to this point of repentance? The first point we see in Psalm 32 is he tells us that we are to repent with honesty, not guile. Psalm 32 verse 2, Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. A guile <coughs> means deceit, or trickery. It can speak of insincerity or hypocrisy. The truth is uh, that all men, uh, believers and unbelievers alike, uh, want their sin covered. Um, even those who profess no faith in, in the Lord, who don't even call them sins, they call them mistakes. The truth is they want those mistakes uh, covered up. But how? A Satan's way is one of darkness, deceit, denial. God's way is by bringing it all to the light. With no guile, and no deceit. I remember I had not been in the country very long when I made a terrible mistake at work. And um, although there were reasons for it and it wasn't entirely my fault, which is normal that we all say that, but a large sum of money was missed in the claim on the client. And under pressure from the client, I had signed off as a, a full and final claim. In other words, we couldn't go back and claim any more. I had sent emails and asked 
others to give me the data I needed to submit the claim, but nevertheless, under some pressure, I signed. And about two or three days later, an, em an envelope arrived from one of the joint venture companies with a whole pile of invoices that related to this claim. And so we had under claim by over $150,000. And I remember in deep distress, probably the most stressed I've been in, in, in work, <coughs> going home, and I remember praying an unthinkable prayer that God would somehow cover up with this mistake. And even as I prayed it, the thought came to mind of exactly what we're talking about, that God does not cover our mistakes. Rather, He brings them into the open so that they can be dealt with without guile, without deceit, honestly and openly before Him. And so, even as I prayed it, a foolish prayer, I knew it couldn't be answered the way I wanted, and sure enough, within a week or so, it had come to light, uh, the gravity of the error, and uh, I was summoned to a disciplinary hearing, the first and hopefully the last of my life. And there the Lord intervened most graciously, and we were even able to lodge a, a supplementary claim and recover the money. But nevertheless, that is not the point. The point is, man is always trying to cover up his sin. A man by nature has this spirit of guile, deceit, of hypocrisy that would cover things up. How does man cover or seek to cover his sin? The first thing is by denial of God and of his law. It is by denial of the fact that it is sin at all. And isn't that the cry of our day? That we dare not call anything a sin when someone else prefers to live that way. So man first covers his sin by a denying that it even is a sin. Well, he may even pass laws to convince others. He may even get the majority of support on his side to say this is not a sin. But his guile will not deceive God. God's word will not change. If God's word calls it a sin in the Old Testament, it remains a sin forever. Now the second way man tries to cover his sin with the spirit of God <coughs> is by self-justification. In other words, he finds some reason that caused him to, to commit that sin. It's the fault of some other. Perhaps he blames his parents or his upbringing. Perhaps he blames the culture around him. Well, this is the language I hear every day. I can't be helped if occasionally it comes out of my mouth too. It is this self-justification that also where it will admit that some fault of sin, yet will have still the self-justification, but it's not as bad as what I've heard someone else say and do. There is denial, there is self-justification. And then a third way that man seeks to cover his sin with guile is by self-improvement. You will often hear it uh, from the Buddhists and how popular Buddhism is in our day and age. How does he cover his sins of the past? Well, he just seeks to do better uh, tomorrow and in the future. And so he will focus on some good deed. May even be some religious participation. But these are man's vain efforts to cover his sin. The fact is, every man wants his sin covered. But God, He covers sin only in Jesus' blood. Hebrews 9 verse 22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. God covers our sin only in Jesus' blood, and He forgives our sin only when it is repented of. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. As I was saying earlier about how reasonable is the call to repentance. This is what Isaiah says. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good 
of the land. Our Lord says, this is the reasonable response of God. And he will forgive that sin that is repented of without guile, with this honesty, with this openness. And that is why in Psalm 51, David's real prayer is for this broken and contrite spirit. That if he can bring before, come before God with that spirit, with that attitude of heart, he has this assurance that God will absolutely not refuse his request. Will absolutely not reject him and crush him in his guilt and sin. Because it is a pleasing, acceptable offering to God. When we come before God with a broken and a contrite spirit, there is no guile in it. It is open and sincere. Now firstly, David says, repent with honesty, not guile. Now secondly, repent with openness, not a concealment. If we read the following verses in Psalm 32, he says, when I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night my hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer, the sea water. It is true that a sincere heart can repent privately and silently before the Lord. And it's something that we should all do every day. We don't need to take our sins to some Roman priest to say that he absolves us. We are to confess our sins before <coughs> the Lord ourselves. And we can certainly do that silently with the right attitude of heart. But there is a great liberty in the open confession of sin. If it is in James that we are encouraged to confess our sins the one to another. It is to bring that secret shame out of the shadows. That is where Satan thrives, in the darkness, in the shadows. That is where he torments. When we bring those things into the light, oh, then we know a great release. Ephesians 5, verse 13. But all things that are approved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Our Lord would have us bring these things into the light. Again I say, with that broken and contrite spirit. The LGBT movement that seeks to bring their open confession and come out, they say, they bring it into the light. But they do it with pride. No, oh, that is not acceptable. We are to bring our sins into the light with due repentance, with due shame. And the Holy Spirit will bring a conviction of sin in the life of the believer. John 16 verse 8 doesn't only say that he will convict us of sin, but that he will convince us. We will be persuaded to agree with God's judgment of our sin. And then the only right response is this humble, earnest a confession. You see what David is writing of here is these past nine months to a year when he kept silence. When the Holy Spirit was convicting him of his sin. But he, gave, he brought no prayer of repentance and he knew no peace. And so while he says, I kept my tongue silent, yet inside me, my very bones, the very depths of me were roaring in agony. There is no peace for the wicked. There is no peace without repentance. His prayer time was silent, but his guilt roared within him. But then he says, in one moment of confession to Nathan, he knew the sweet release. Listen to how he words it in verse 5, and you can read the actual account of it in 2 Samuel, but he is definitely speaking of that very moment I acknowledge my sin unto thee. Remember he says to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. 
and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. See now. In 2 Samuel 12, verse 13, David is remembering that moment. He said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan, without a moment's hesitation, answers and says, And the Lord hath put away or covered your sin. You shall not die. Perhaps you, like me, would love to hear Nathan say that to you. To hear someone say to you, that God has forgiven your sin. And that is why it is recorded in the scriptures, because that is where and how God speaks to us. That is where he gives us that assurance. Nathan, the prophets, the apostles, the Son of God himself, say those words to every true repentant sinner. Put away your sin. You shall not die. Oh, what a, a glorious a gospel. I uh, used up my time, but the third uh, instruction that David will bring in this master in this Psalm 32 is that man is to repent now, not later. If David learned anything uh, from that preceding year, when there was a roaring of guilt within him that he could not find peace with God, now, if you could give one instruction to the sinner, it is this. Do not delay. If, if the Holy Spirit has put his finger on some area of your life, if there is some aspect that is keeping, hindering your walk with the Lord, do not delay. And bring it an open a confession. And he concludes with these wonderful words. That for that repentant sinner, they can be glad in the Lord. They can rejoice, ye righteous. And David calls the repentant sinner righteous. And Thomas Goodwin, the Puritan, in his preaching ministry said, he had two great aims, and they were two of the things he found most difficult to achieve in his ministry. The first was to make the sinner sad in his sin. And the second was to make the saint happy in his righteousness, in that imputed righteousness. He saw over the course of his ministry how comfortable the sinner can be in his sin, how little he is moved with any remorse or regret, how little he feels of that distance from God. But he also saw how sad the saint can be when he doubts at God's grace and mercy towards him. He doubts the goodness of God, his very readiness <coughs> to take away our sin as soon as we come to him in that broken and contrite spirit. And may he restore unto us and that joy of his salvation as we take to heart that David's instructions in this matter of repentance. We will close then please by singing the words of hymn 347 ring the bells of heaven there is joy today for a soul returning from the world see how the father meets him out upon the way welcoming his weary wandering child no matter how far we have strayed in our lives no matter what we have done David would say return to the father with a broken and contrite spirit, and you will find him running to meet you with arms open wide. We will stand together as we sing the words.
sure that we can sing the anthem of the free. Those who have been made free in thy son are free indeed. A free of that guilt of sin. A free of the wrath of God and the judgment against that sin. Oh, we thank you for our Savior who has borne our iniquities upon himself and set us truly free. And Lord, we would join with David in this desire to minister your mercy that we have freely received, to minister it, minister it to others around us. Open thou our lips, we pray, that they might be filled with messages for thee. Fill our hearts, Lord, with that same mercy <coughs> and grace for others which we have received free upon ourselves. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labour is not in vain in the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Amen. <coughs>